Hey friends, so today we're going to take a look at clipping and loudness. I'm not talking about loudness that has to do with streaming services like Spotify or Apple Music, where music is commonly mastered to about negative 12 or negative 14 LUFS. Instead, I'm talking about mixes that you might hear on like Beatport or mixes that you might hear a club DJ drop, where they're commonly mastered to about negative eight or negative four LUFS. This is extremely loud music. Now, these loudness levels are very difficult to achieve without significant caveats to your mixes or without a thorough understanding of how clipping stages work, okay? And so that's what we're gonna go over in this video. Also, if Ableton's your thing, it's my thing too. So make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so I've got a mix here, and this mix is definitely very, very hard to make very loud. This is a chill bass track, okay? Mixes that are easy to make loud are mixes that have a lot of bright signal, okay? There's a lot going on, and there's a lot in the top register, and it's not sparse. This song is very sparse. Take a listen. Right? This is very difficult to make loud. But let's go ahead and we're going to grab a limiter. Now, I'm using FabFilter Pro L2 in this situation. You could use any limiter, um, but the reason I'm using this one is because of that it has a handy LUFS meter down here, which means loudness units at full scale, okay? So this is just gonna give us a number. It's gonna spit out a number telling us how loud the mix is. All right, let's go ahead and make this loud enough for the streaming services around negative 14 LUFS. So I'm gonna start driving gain into this, and of course, I should do a couple quick things. Whenever you're making music for streaming services, you want to have a negative one true peak because the compression algorithms work on your music. Sometimes they can make peak signal, which makes distortion. I'm sure you've uploaded mixes to SoundCloud or other places and you're like, why is this distorting? Well, just go ahead and do this. It'll make your life a lot better. So true peak limiting is on, negative one. Let's go ahead and turn on the oversampling and I'm going to bring this up to the right level. Okay, so this mix sounds okay. It sounds pretty all right at negative 14 LUFS, but unfortunately this isn't nearly as loud as club DJ mixes, okay? As very, very loud beat port style mixes, right? Now, if I wanted to make things that loud, I'd want to push this thing way higher. I'd want this to this LUFS meter to read what, like, you know, negative, but somewhere between negative eight and negative four LUFS, right? So if I did that, I'm going to volume compensate the video, but take a listen. <laughs> uh, sounds so bad. It's like trash, right? Now, Pro L2 and then many of the other limiters that are available these days can give you miraculous loudness, okay? They, the algorithms inside of them are, are designed in such a way that they can make your mixes sound incredibly loud, even though you didn't do your due diligence in your mix to even deserve that loudness, right? They can still spit out a lot, spit out a lot. but in this case, obviously, this is horrible. This is not going to work. Now, I could do a couple things to this mix to make it sound better, such as turning up the release time a little bit, uh, and then maybe decreasing the attack time, meaning that the release stage will happen sooner, and what will happen is, is it will make the entire act of limiting every single time there's a transient, it'll last a little bit longer, right? So it'll sound smoother. But now this is gonna sound splatty, take a listen. Now, even though that is maybe marginally a little bit more acceptable, this is just not going to work, okay? Now, let's talk about a couple things we can do. So, first of all, I've made an EQ here, and as you can hear, this is kind of a dark mix. What do I mean by dark mix? It means that much of the energy of this mix is in the low end, okay? And I would say that almost too much energy is in the low end. So, in this EQ, what I've done is I have pulled out some of the sub energy, okay? Because there's just no need for it to be there, right? I've pulled out some mid-range, and what this is, this is kind of a resonant hump that many of the instruments are making. And what I've done is I've compensated by turning up some mid-range that's a little bit higher, and then I've added a little bit of this presence range, okay? And the result is going to be a louder mix. Well, why is that? Even though it's not physically louder, meaning that the waveforms themselves are going to actually go down in amplitude, it's going to sound louder to you. Why? Because humans 
hear brighter sounds as louder and more present, more there, okay, more more immediate, right? That's how we perceive loudness, okay? So when we shift the energy, we tilt the energy, as some would say, away from the subs, we can get a little bit of a louder mix. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this EQ on and let's take a listen to the difference. Now, this is still total trash, but at least in this situation, we've prepared the mix a little bit better for this limiter, and this limiter's uh, curves that it's making with the release times are a little bit smoother. Okay, take a look again. Okay, but unfortunately, this still is not, <laughs> this is still just is not going to work. We can't even get past negative 10 in this situation without significant distortion, without it sounding really bad, all right? So what do you do? What I'm about to do is when I hit this Q key on my keyboard, I'm going to be enabling a series of clippers, okay? There's clippers on certain tracks, there's clippers on buses, and there's a clipper right before this Pro L. And you'll be able to see and hear when I turn this on, there's a little indicator light right here. Let's go ahead and take a look at the limiter as we do this. Wow, that's some magic. That's pretty crazy. Now we're not challenging the limiter nearly as much. The limiter does not have to react as hard to those transients coming in because we've limited the transients. We have made those transients have less peak signal, okay? I've also changed the shape of the transients coming in so I can change the shape of my limiting, right? I could probably get away with a little bit less attack and the release could be a little bit shorter. So I'll go ahead and restart my LUFS meter and let's take a look at the loudness difference. Now, again, I don't think I would ever like the way that this song sounds this loud, no matter what I do, okay? This is just not a pleasing mix to me, okay? This is just a chill track. But as you can see, I'm reaching, I'm starting to reach into those levels of kind of club DJ mixes. And the vehicle that allowed me to get there is of course, there's some side chain compression in here. There's some well-designed um, EQ in here, but the real vehicle that got me there is clipping, okay? And transparent clipping, okay? So I know that I'm glossing over a bunch of different concepts here, but if you're enjoying this video and you're enjoying my teaching style, I have actually a webinar where I rapid fire through a bunch of different Ableton techniques to get mixes to sound really, really nice. If you take this quick little webinar, your mixes will probably sound a lot better very quickly. This webinar also explains my big Ableton online courses. I have a course community and three different courses at this moment that you can take right now. And to my knowledge, these are the biggest and longest courses available on Ableton music making that are on the internet. Each one is 25 hours plus of content just like this. And then there's a community discord aspect. It's really, really awesome. And I highly encourage that you check it out. Anyway, let's get back to it. So let's go ahead and go over what the process of clipping is. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this limiter and let's take a look at the kick drum track. Okay, so this kick drum is kind of purposefully splatty, right? Take a listen to, it goes. Let's go ahead and look at it in session view. Now, if you look in session view, a lot of folks, I don't know why they don't understand the session view and arrangement view are, are tandem or parallel views of your mix, okay? What's nice about session view is that you can take the VU meters and expand them out, right? And so we can look at a really detailed image of the track output controls. Now, when I play this kick drum, we can see that there are two colors here. There is a bright green and a dark green. The bright green is showing us RMS level, okay? Uh, and what that means is that's essentially how loud something actually sounds to us. The dark green, however, this is what's called peak signal. Human beings are really bad at detecting how loud peak signals are. Why is that? Because very quick sounds, it's very difficult for us to determine the loudness of very quick sounds. It's very easy for us to determine the loudness of long drawn out sounds, okay? So moving on to clipping, essentially clipping is when you try to turn a waveform up above the carrying capacity of whatever circuit you're running it through. In this situation, we're in the digital world, okay? So to clip this 
waveform, what we're doing is we're shaving the top of the waveform off, okay? Now, in Ableton Live, you have a really great tool for this called Ableton Saturator. Now, if I grab Saturator and I put it in here and I feed, let's put 10 decibels in and remove 10 decibels. And mind you, we're on the analog clip algorithm. There are many different algorithms you can use. But now check it out. Without the saturator, let's look at the peak signal. This guy right here will show us what the peak signal is. Three, negative 3.64 is the peak signal that we're making. Now, if I turn on the saturator where I'm driving 10 decibels into it and taking 10 decibels out, I'm essentially going up past this little marker right here and I'm clipping the signal. Now watch. Boom. Negative 9.61. We have saved... Okay, we've saved about 6 dB of signal. Now, obviously, you can't hear the difference. Right? Human ears aren't designed to detect that change in peak signal, right? It's too fast, okay? And what we've also done, what, what is this doing for us? Well, what we've also done is we've made it so that now the limiter on the master track or the bus compressors on your bus or so on and so forth, none of those devices now have to deal with that insanely loud peak signal, okay? They don't have to deal with it, all right? And how that translates to your mix is that you can get away with more compression, more limiting, more gain going into those devices, making a louder mix, okay? So that's the power of clipping. Now, I've already done a video specifically on using Ableton Saturator for this. Now, in this situation, though, I want to show you something else. Let's go ahead and bring this up to, I don't know, plus 15, minus 15, right? So we're feeding 15 decibels into the saturator and taking 15 decibels out. Let's go ahead and listen to the difference. Now, we have saved an insane amount of gain here. Negative three, negative 13, right? 10 decibels of gain, but we can hear the saturation, right? We can start to hear that clipping, okay? It, it makes the kick drum sound different. And maybe this is a pleasing change, which is a lot of the times why it's nice to use distortion and saturation on drums because sometimes the changes that they can make can be pleasing. Maybe this is a better sound, but in this situation, I'm not after changing the sound of the drums. I'm just trying to transparently clip the peak signal. So 15 decibels is too much. Let's try 13. So negative 13 over here. Unfortunately, this saturator is still making the kick drum sound different at 13 in, negative 13 out, right? It's still making the kick drum sound different. Now I could switch over to digital clip. Let's take a listen to this. So without it, with it, I'm still getting a change to the tone. If you're gonna use Ableton Saturator to do clipping, you can only use analog clip or digital clip. You could also use Wave Shaper, but that's a whole nother topic. But these two are gonna be the only algorithms on here that try to transparently clip your peak signals, okay? So both of these algorithms on this saturator aren't really getting the job done above about 10 decibels, right? So if I put this on 10, for example, again, as you heard before, we get a transparent clip of those peak signals. Right? Now, for most of you that are preparing mixes for streaming services, this is about as far as you'd ever have to go. And honestly, Saturator is amazing. But what I want to do now is I want to show you a different plugin. So let's take a look at Kazrog's K Clip 3. Now, the absolute god guru of k-clip <laughs> i have to say is baphometrics and this video in a lot of ways is a just a quick and dirty look at using clipping stages to make louder mixes if you really want to understand this and you're commonly making mixes for club djs or you're commonly making mixes for beatport i would totally recommend going to his channel and spending the insane amount of time that it takes to watch all these videos but this guy is by far I would say the authority, okay, on using clippers to make loud mixes, okay? So so definitely check him out. But let me show you some of the reasons why K-Clip 3 is incredible. It's an incredibly awesome clipper, all right? Now, remember before on Saturator, I was, I was having to manually input the input and output. In this situation, I can just turn on link and I can turn this up. And as you can see, the output goes down as the input goes in, okay? Now let's see what we can get away with now.
Amazing. Even at 13 in and negative 13 out, I'm still getting a transparent clip of this kick drum. Let's try to keep going. Oh, sounds like around negative 14, we start to get a little bit of distortion in there and it starts to sound different. Now, another thing we could do is we could turn it on a different algorithm. So just like on Ableton Saturator, there are different clipping algorithms. Sometimes crisp can make things sound a little bit better. In this situation, neither of those algorithms are really gonna change much. You can also soft clip, meaning that as you turn and soften up, this will actually make the distortion a little bit more audible, okay? This will change the clipping curve, but we're not after that. We're after as transparent of clipping as we can get. So I'm gonna leave this on ne uh, 13 in and negative 13 out. And you can also see that we're getting this nice visual of our clipping. Anything that's in red, that's the clip signal. And if you wanna just listen to the clip signal, you can turn on wet and listen to the aspect of the signal that's getting clipped out, right? Okay, so now we have saved ourselves transparently almost a full 10 decibels. That is incredible. And K-Clip is allowing you to do that, okay? K-Clip's algorithms are have been designed over time uh, to try to get the most transparent clipping of peak signal that you can get as far as I have found. Okay, it's truly amazing. Now, you can also put clippers on buses. Okay, so in this situation, here's our drum bus. Right, that's our drum bus. And as you can see, there's some peak signal in there too. Let's see if we can transparently clip some of that. So I'm putting K-Clip on the bus now. And what we can do is I can turn on link here and start to drive this up a little bit. And as you can see, we're not, see, you wanna get this all the way up to the top, right? Right now we're not clipping, so we're gonna bring this up. Oh, a little bit of an audible change there. So it seems like, yet again, for some reason today, 13 in and negative 13 out is making a transparent clip. And as you can see, we're saving just a little bit more. Let's go ahead and look at the actual uh, peak signal difference. So without it, negative 11.2 with it, we've saved another dB there. Now you might think, well, just one dB, man, that's, that's really not that much. And you're right, it isn't that much. But at the end of the day, this very small amount right here can add up by the time you get to that master limiter, right? By the time you get to that final stage, you have saved yourself so many peak signal decibels that you're able to get away with louder mixes, okay? Let's go ahead and look at the master. Same thing. Now on the master, this is a K-clip. Let's go ahead and just delete this and we'll do it again from scratch. <clears throat> I'm going to now enable all the tracks. So this is our mix, right? Let's go ahead and I'll start it from the beginning here. And I'm gonna grab a K-clip and drop it, in the drop it in the master. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what we can get away with here. Amazing, so yet again, we can look at the peak signal here without the K-clip. Negative 5.6 with the K-clip. Again, we've saved ourselves a lot of peak signal going into whatever limiter I decide to use on my master track. So that's the concept, using clippers to control peak signals. Now, clippers are not always the best tool to use, okay? Commonly, most folks will find out about clippers, uh, Ableton Saturator or K-Clip or whatever other clipping solution you wanna use, and they will just start profusely putting it on every single track. This is a really bad idea, and let me show you why. Here's a track that I'm gonna add to the mix. It's a kind of little, cool little thing at the end. Right, this little sound here. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at it in session view. Now you can see that there's a decent amount of peak signal in that. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab a K-clip and put it on there. And we're gonna try to clip just transparently the peak signal. Okay, so I'm gonna link the in and out. Let's go ahead and start doing that. Ooh. Back it off. 
Okay, so it seems like no matter what I do, even if I have a very low amount of clipping, we still get that audible clipping sound, right? It's just, it's not pleasing, right? It's, it's, it's too much, right? Let's try to move it over to crisp. Now, this is one of those situations where changing the algorithm actually really does gain us something, right? Uh, this actually sounds a little bit more pleasing, but I'm still hearing harmonic distortion. And I'm honestly not getting enough clipping to make this worth it. Now, will you ever hear this kind of clipping in the mix? Maybe not. But this isn't really doing an effective job. Negative 18. We're only going up above that just a little bit, okay? So, I'm gonna get rid of this K-clip for now, and I'm gonna show you the tool that would be much better served for this specific track. And believe it or not, it's a compressor, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> I've heard it said that stop using compressors entirely, and that's just nonsense, okay? Compressors are dynamic tools, and clippers are dynamic tools. But in this situation, I'm going to grab a glue compressor, and I'm going to control this signal. Let's take a look at the signal real quick. Now, you can see this is a reverb signal. It's building up energy over time, right? So it's getting louder as the reverb kind of builds up in the run, right? So a compressor would do a great job of as the signal gets louder, it'll push the signal down. So I'm going to go ahead and bring my attack all the way down and start to just back into this sound a little bit. That might be a little bit harsh, maybe something like negative 12. All right, that sounds pretty transparent. I'll bring up the makeup gain. Now, something else has happened, and this is common with compression. What compression can do also is it can take the RMS signal and the peak signal and move them apart from each other. Because what's happening is that the compressor cannot hear the signal before it hears it, right? Some compressors, you can change the look ahead time and allow that difference to occur. But in this situation, you can see <clears throat> physically that the peak signal and the RMS signal are kind of staying the same distance apart from each other. Now, we can take advantage of this phenomenon by doing what? Well, of course, we can clip after the compressor. So I'll go back to K-Clip and I'll drag it in here. And I know that crisp mode is going to work better with this sound. I'll link these two together and let's see what we can save. Now, did you hear that? There was no audible clipping. Let's see if we can get away with more. Oh, a little bit audible clipping. Seems like 8 in, 8 out is the move here. Incredible. Now in the mix... Amazing. Now, now that I've added a sound, I might need to go back into my master and readjust this K-clip or the K-clip on the bus or who knows what, right? It's a really important thing to remain aware as you add sounds of what your clipping stages are doing, okay? And, and keeping an eye on them, right? Now, I don't think that there's ever going to be a world in which I enjoy this specific tune at like negative five LUFS. It's just not set up properly for it. And maybe you're asking yourself at this moment, why should I care about this stuff? I mix jazz or I mix R&B or I mix rock and roll. Well, the thing to understand is that controlling peak levels versus your RMS gives the power back to you, okay? When you have peak signals that are just kind of whiling out, it's very, very difficult to control how a compressor is going to respond. If you want to work with compressors, you're working with dynamics processing, multiband compressors, limiters, at the end of the day, clipping is just another tool that you can put into your belt to make dynamics processing a little bit easier on you. When you have a very splatty signal, Sometimes clipping is really the only solution to get it prepared or ready for other types of dynamic processing, okay? Now, I think it's fair to say that you could make any song as loud as you want. You could make any song negative one LUFS. You could make it super loud. Will it sound pleasing? Probably not. At the end of the day, there's certain music that sounds very good at these incredibly loud levels and most music that doesn't. The music that reacts to being very, very loud usually already has harmonic distortion content in it. There is a shift, a tilt toward the brighter sounds, and so on and so forth, like I showed you before. So when it comes to using clippers, context is key, right? Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you in the next one.